Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, a global community of financial advisors sharing and learning with one another to drive the positive evolution of financial advice. To get involved, go to xyadvisor.com or simply download the XY Advisor app. This podcast is proudly brought to you by Challenger. At Challenger, we want to help you ensure that your retiree clients can meet their retirement needs today and tomorrow. To access thought leadership, insights, and tips on retirement planning for your clients, head on over to challenger.com.au forward slash XY. Welcome back to the XY Advisor Podcast. My name is Fraser Jack, and I'm joined here by a man who really needs no introduction, Noel Whitaker. Welcome. Hi, great to be here, Fraser. Thank you for being here. Now, we're chatting all things the changing landscape of retirement, and who better to chat to than you? Obviously, you've just uh, released a book all about retirement as well, and uh, you, you comment uh, a lot on radio and, and talk back. You write articles. You are a full-time, well, conversationalist, full-time uh, producer of content on this topic. So thank you so much for, for chatting to us. It's a busy space, and the, contact, and the content just keeps coming and coming. There's more stuff every day. Yep. Yeah, definitely. There's certainly, uh, there's certainly lots of little pockets that we can go down and have conversation but I thought we might start with the over the overall the overall size of the system the overall size of the people that it affects that it's involved all of these you know we, we talk numbers but they're all individual humans coming through this new system or the system that um, that's growing and exploding so let's talk about the size of the system and how it's coping um, you know where it is now and where it's moving to well I think the world's facing this life expectancy tsunami. I mean, people are living longer, but they often spend more on healthcare in the last year of their life than the rest of their life. Governments, thanks to COVID, have borrowed massively. So you've got a much increasing demand at the same time as resources are drying up. So, you know, the, the world is, is really between a rock and a hard place. Yes, the old perfect well, storm. No interest storm. rates haven't helped either because there's a misconception that I need my money in the bank, which is the worst place to have it. So we need to educate people about investing wisely, uh, you know, but it's growing pressure. Certainly is. And you mentioned that uh, money in the bank conversation. It's, it's, it's one of those things that's always been the secure place, isn't it? That, and it's always been around that security. Well, we talk money. about risk, you see. And in our world, risk means it's volatile. But to the average man in the street or person in the street these days, uh, Risk means I might lose it all, uh, and, and that's not what we mean. When, when they say we must invest in more risky assets, we mean in more growth-oriented assets, but they think, oh, I might lose it. Yep, definitely, definitely. One of the major issues of the retirement incomes policy that came out recently was that people need to be more efficient with their retirement savings. Now, was that... Um that was a finding from that, that policy? They had three basic recommendations from the, from the Retirement Income Review. The, the first was that people need much more education. They're overwhelmed. Secondly, it's all too complex. And the complexity is made worse by the interaction between aged care, pension, tax, you know, all those sort of things. And last of all, people still expected to have their superannuation intact when they die, people are loath to spend their super. Yep. And because they're loath to spend their super, they then have a less good retirement than they may have had if they spent a bit better, yep. which is why, why you've now got these uh, retirement income products, yep. which can be very effective if used in the right place. Yeah. Now we'll get to the mindset in a minute. I might just duck back though to the, the overall system. Um, I know that uh, obviously you've re released a book recently uh, and in that book I, I read about just the sheer number uh, of retirees coming through. So from 3.9 million sort of, uh, well, 2019 through to about 5.7 million. I think in the next 10 years, just off the top of my head, 
the over 75s, our fastest growing demographic, will increase by 101%. Now, that's massive. But also to, to complicate it, there are, I guess, one sort of people is on their own, another is couples, and the third is a couple where one needs the care of the other one. And that's the tricky part. If you're on your own and you're disabled or getting into bad health, who takes you to the doctor and the hairdresser? Who helps you with the bill payment? If you're a couple and one needs care, does the other person who needs care, are they in the home with you or are they in separate accommodation? You know, they talk about retirement being a, a worry-free time. It's probably the most challenging time in a person's life. Yeah, it's extremely complex when it comes to, you know, separating partners and, and yeah. yeah. And then, of course, often one partner dies and they remarry, which is fine. And they want to keep their finances in each side of the line. And uh, that can create all sorts of estate planning uh, complexities. Yeah. Yeah. Estate planning complexities also uh, when uh, when they're being tested for income and assets. Is it, is it one? Is it two? Is it? Yes. But also if, if I'm a newly formed couple and I'm old and my partner goes into care and I pay the RAD, when she dies, that's part of her estate, not mine. That could be half a million dollars that my kids don't get. Yep, so an absolute minefield. Yes. Uh, it, from the system as a whole, how do you think the system's going to go? You mentioned the perfect storm. Like, what, what, what does that look like and, and what are the solutions? Well, the whole of the retirement income review is based on the fact that you'll have your private savings and some sort of a lifetime pension and the age pension. And that's the three pillars that the retirement income review said is the way it should work. So I guess the big one is, is the age pension sustainable? You know, the, there's, there's a lot of a tax on it. At the moment, a couple can have over $800,000 and live in a million-dollar home and still get a part age pension. You know, I would think that may change. I mean, about three years ago, they cut the assets test. I can see that happening again, I think. You know, they are now saying, why should a person, well, they, they say pension, if you're, if you're on the pension, you're on welfare. Why should a person with $800,000 of financial assets be on welfare? They're not just the fastest growing demographic. They all have plenty of time and they all vote and they all talk. Now, this year there's going to be an election. You saw what happened when the Labor tried to take on the oldies with the franking credits and things. So it's becoming practically difficult for the government to make these changes. It, it is, but, but from an economics point of view, it seems impossible that they can't make the changes. Well, no, I mean, you know, they just, I believe that governments are basically hopeless of all persuasions. They, they bungle, you know. Yes, that's, I, guess, uh, I guess that comes back to, to, to a short-term agenda uh, versus the well, long-term agenda. You and I were government workers now. We'd be monitored it would go through legal, it would go through compliance. It would have taken 17 hours of work to set this up. Yeah, You yeah. can ring me and I can just do it because we're just ordinary people. Yes, and I would think if you and I managed our clients' money the way that the the, uh, the, the, the budget's managed, we'd probably end up in jail. Yes. <laughs> Overspending and spending money they don't have. No, um, no, but, no, no. But anyway, that uh, that's what they do. I'm not going to uh, attack them. Um, so, yeah, so definitely a lot of problems with the system as, as in general. Could it be something like, uh, you know, like with Medicare, we have a levy where we, we pay and, you know, because of such an expensive system, is that, is that where we're heading? Well, one of the members of the Aged Care Royal Commission recommended a massive aged care hike. He recommended if you're over 40 and you're in the top tax bracket, you should pay an extra 8%. So, A, why should someone 39 pay less tax than someone 41? And what would happen to the economy if everyone took $150 a week pay cut. So it's just not going to work. Yeah. The other commissioner recommended a 1% levy. Now, Josh Frydenberg said, no, it'll be productivity. We won't have any levies. It's election year. We'll just be more productive, you know. And every year they promise to cut red tape. So the idea of a levy obviously is, is coming, it's gone, it's been told it's not going to come in and, and those sort of things. But at the end of the day, the, the financials just don't work, do they? Well, the Medicare levy now is not spent on health anyway. 
It's the same as the petrol excise tax. The petrol excise tax is not spent on roads. The Medicare levy is not spent specifically on health. Now, I re- remember the budget repair levy of 2%. Uh, that was after the budget got into trouble with the GFC. Yep. Uh, I guess that's an option. But if you look at the number of taxpayers, there's a very few number of taxpayers in the top bracket. The numbers run something like, I think, about 15% of taxpayers pay 60% of the income tax, and they can't squeeze them much more. Yep. Now, is this, is this solvable, I guess, in many years from now when uh, the superannuation guarantee has had a, a chance to be there for somebody's entire working life? I guess that might help, but I think they'll still need some way to stop someone retiring and blowing the lot. I mean, that's always been the fear. They retire and blow their super and go on and go on the age pension. And just yesterday, an Uber driver was telling me, I'm working, the bloke next door is a lazy bugger, you know, and he's got a full age pension, he's saved nothing. So this is, this is another issue we face. Yep. Uh, because if, if you look at it, a person could have nothing, a couple now could have nothing at all and get about a 35,000 indexed income. And, of course, every 100,000 extra bloke saved, he loses $8,000 a year in pension. Yeah, so that's a that's a public perception thing. Yep. Yeah. There's, there's, t- talk to me about the mindset around the pension because that's certainly always been uh, it's, it's something that people hold on to or don't want to lose or don't want to move into uh, to, to brackets and they're almost upset even though they've got some money to live on that or some savings to live on that they're not getting the pension. Well, I think there's two kinds of people. One says, I do not expect the governor to take care of me. I don't want to be in the, I don't want to be beholding to them. The other half will say, I've paid taxes all my life, now I'm getting a pension. There's a third older group have the wrong belief that there was a, a, a pension fund in the 50s and 60s to guarantee them an income. And that and that's just not true. Yeah, very difficult. Now I want to talk um around the mindset in, in a lot of cases, because a, a lot of the conversations tend to tend to move back towards the mindset or what's going through someone's mind at the time. Um, there's a big shift uh, and a transitional period from, you know, working to uh, to not working uh, and getting used to that, that concept of, you know, being working full time or whatever it might be. And a lot of that mindset, uh, you know, that the, the time that takes to transition all depends on what's going through someone's mind or how they see things or how they believe in things. What are your thoughts on the, that transition period? Look, All the research shows that the better you prepare for retirement, the better it is. The person worst off has suddenly said you're finished tomorrow and they get $400,000 and all they've ever ever had is a bank account. Uh, They're the ones who die young, I think. You know, you need to transition to retirement. You need to plan for retirement. Uh, To me, you must have a sense of purpose. A, A sense of purpose is massively healthy. And in the last 50 pages of my book, I talk about all the things to live a long, healthy, happy retirement. And that gets back to your your social network, exercise and diet. Most things are controllable. Exercise and diet are controllable. A lot of people don't think about it. Yeah, certainly right. And uh, like when when planners are doing plans, often they don't include those types of ideas in their plan, but of course it makes a big difference to things like longevity and and, and purpose and, and how happy people are in retirement. Yes, I mean, I think it's great to give the retirees a longevity test. There's a, there's a couple of tests you, you can do, but some planners tell me retirees don't want to know that. Well, I think it's important. It's particularly important, I mean, if one person has a much shorter life expectancy. I heard about the case the guy smokes, he's overweight, He's quick-tempered, the wife's placid, but she's got a family family history of arthritis. So he may be dead at 70 and she may go to 90. So who will take care of her, who will take care of her in those last 20 years? So I think life expectancy tests are critical. It gives you some idea of what you're planning for. Most people underestimate how long they live. Most people live with most people retire with far more than they thought they would. That's the point. So how would you have that conversation with a client that says to you, look, oh, I don't want to know? What would you say to them? Well, I haven't been a financial planner for many, many years, and we, we sold the business 14 years ago. But, I mean, I think you've got to face these things. And I think you've got to say to the client, right, well, 
you need to work it out because as you get older, you can't drink as much or travel as much. So your expenditure tends to be higher in early retirement and then drop down in later retirement. Uh, so, you, so you need to plan that. So the more aware people are, I think, the better, the better choices they can make. Yep. You mentioned expenditure. There's been a lot of conversation over years around the, what that expenditure looks like, and you just mentioned it starts out higher and, 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 and reduces yes. down. Um, some people tell me it starts out higher and then reduces down, but the, the medical expenses come up so it stays the same. What, what is it actually? Like how, how should planners be forecasting expenses into, uh, you know, into, a, 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 into a financial plan for retirement living expenses or retirement spending expenses? Well, the big question is how much do you need when you retire? And you've got ASFA published figures, which I think are reasonable. Other people that other people say that's nonsense. They're only scaring people because uh, really everyone's different. I mean, do you drink or don't you? Do you travel first class or coach? You know, do you visit visit your kids overseas or don't you? You got one car or two cars. So that's why I think it's critically important you do a budget as you're approaching retirement and try to get a, a an idea of what that will be like after retirement and adjust it. In my book and on my website there's a a lump sum calculator which can tell you how much you'll need but that requires assumptions and a big assumption is the rates you can earn and I say to people all the time because people say what do I use I said well look you do this every year this retirement drawdown calculator the lump sum needed calculator is an estimation of what you would need using today's figures but in a year's time we might have inflation we might have higher interest rates. We might not. Your health may have changed. So people need to do these projections, but they need to do them at least every year. And it's very simple to do it. Yeah, so that ongoing, uh, again, that ongoing planning scenario where you are looking at your budget and you're looking at the assumptions and looking at you know where you might be. And um, But for the overall spending, even if whatever the number is, you mentioned it sort of comes down as you get older. Is that still, that's still the case? Well, you just can't travel as much and drink as much and you have all the suits and ties you need and you know <laughs> yes you just don't need it that's the whole point but yep. if you've got kids who put their hands out that's an issue uh look everyone is different you can't put anyone in a box with this one everyone must work out their own retirement yep fair enough um and it's, it's all, obviously it's a difficult one for people to try and work out because they can probably work it out as you mentioned this year's budget yeah, um, but you know, none of us have been in the future. We can't can't quite work out after the next few years what that's going to look like. Is, is there any modelling or anything that you you like to look off when it comes well, to that? Well, if you look at the ASPA thing, they break it all up. I mean, you've got rates and insurance and phone bill. You know, uh, fares. If you're in a golf club, you've got sport. You know, it's it, it, you just sit down. There's no excuse for sitting down saying, "Well, how much do we spend on food every every week? What's reasonable? How much on booze? How much to travel?" Yep. You've just got to sit down and do the numbers. It's not difficult at all. Yep. And, yep. And those ASFA numbers, those ASFA numbers, they set them all out. Yeah. Now, a lot of conversation around um, when when we talk to planners or, or around the concept of budgeting and, and cash flow as a service that they offer. Uh, everybody jumps to you know younger lives, um, you know young individuals saving for a family, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's very it's critical for this uh, this uh, retirement planning as well. Well, to me, the most important thing is come to retirement debt free. The last thing you want is a mortgage on retirement with no income or on on the pension. But worse still, is no home. So people really need from a young age to have a goal to have a paid off house on their retirement day. Yep. Now I've seen some stats recently on the, the concept of happiness around um, uh, having a home versus not having a home when you're entering retirement. You know, I've heard the arguments is cheaper to rent, but most people don't invest what they save by renting. Uh, and all, and also, I mean, if you've got a home, you've got free rent for life. Plus, if you, things get bad, you've got capital you can draw on, either by way of a equity release or a, a reverse mortgage or something. A house gives you free rent and a backstop. I can think of nothing more important than a house. 
Okay, fantastic. And now uh, I wanted to talk about the concept of technology is obviously growing. Um, there is a lot more new things coming out, as you mentioned. You've got you've got a calculator yourself. Um, how's how does technology and the changing you know landscape around technology uh, affecting retirees? Well, I guess most retirees I know have kids overseas, uh, which means they can have regular meetings by Zoom or FaceTime. Uh, most retirees have email and stuff. I mean, I think most most retirees are the same as the youngies. And I think it's important for, for retirees to be up to date. One of the worst things is, is, is a self-talk. Don't start saying, I'm too old for that. Once you, once you start saying, I'm too old for that, you're on a downward path. Yep. And you've got to have good self-talk. Yep. So so I think mental, that, that self-talk and that mental health or that, um, you know, that awareness around you know how you're feeling and what you're doing and how to how to solve it is sort of a, a lead for both finance uh, financial matters as well as uh, as well as you know physical health matters. Oh yeah, you need uh, the monitor. Yeah, you know, an yep. annual checkup. You have an annual health checkup, an annual financial health checkup. You know. So for, for financial financial planners out there helping uh, people with their their plans, obviously they're just focusing on their their financial side. How can they get more involved in the, you know, making sure people are happy or making sure people have, um, are, are, you know, are, are positive in, in ways in, in their mental health rather, you know, obviously they're not, you know, they're not qualified, but, you know, in that in that gentle, uh, positive way. Well, when markets crash, as they always have and always will, the customers want someone they can ring up and talk to. And that's when the phones go mad. And that stops people cashing it all out on March the 23rd when the markets all crashed and bounced back again. You know, they give comfort to the clients, I think. The clients need to know there's someone there for them. And based on the concept that you probably can't over-communicate with, with clients. Um, well, I think you can. I mean, you don't want to give them too much information. I think I, I think a quarterly newsletter is perfect. Yep. I think an annual client briefing with some good speakers and a quarterly news, but it's about right. You, okay. can, you sort of don't want to overpush them because people really need to not think about it the whole time. People need to have a, have a happy retirement and not check their superannuation every hour, you know, and, and enjoy life and travel and photography and sport, whatever they want to do. Yep. They uh, don't need to be on the phone with their planner every day. Yep. Now, you mentioned planning, and obviously, you know, the you, I think the words you use were the better you prepare, the better, you know, your life's going to be in yeah. retirement. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to sort of planning, I mean, your, your, your book is a retirement made simple, and it's around the concept of, you know, if you really, uh, within the 30 years of planning for retirement. So talk to me yeah. about that, that time leading up to retirement and how, and how that is, you know, like, obviously, it's now or yesterday was the best time to start, and if not, then now. Uh, yes. Talk to me about how that um, that tightens as you get closer to retirement. Well, A, the earlier you start, the earlier you get used to the behaviour of shares because I think there's no investment as good as shares. As we know with, with compounding, every time your money doubles, there's more growth in the last double than the sum of the previous doubles. You know, I was playing golf with a guy last week. He got half a million in super and now. I said, well, half a million now. Eight years, a million, 16 years, two million, 24 years, four million, 32 years, eight million compound. So they need to get, need to, need to understand the importance of starting early, if possible, and the importance of getting the best return possible. You know, and that's where you start. And I guess the closer you move, the more, the, the less choices you have. What do you mean choices? It's- As in the choices of, you know the big because you, the choices will provide you with uh, the fu- the funding will provide you with choices in retirement choices in how you live yeah. choices of where you live communities so many more choices yep oh yep. yes yeah like the things like private health insurance I mean the two things people need are a home and private health insurance and uh, all, I mean they should also make sure that they've got three or four years planned expenses in cash without a doubt. Otherwise, they're forced to dump assets when the market's having one of its normal downturns. Because what people fail to understand, I think, is that the term is short, the rate don't matter very much. I mean, if you've got a two or three year term, 1% or 8% makes no difference effectively. It's the long term where the money is. But you won't be too badly off copying a 0.5% for part of your money for a couple of years. Yep, very good. Thank you. And um, and just the compounding, again, the compounding question that you know that sort of comes up again and again and again is that some one thing that you find repeat you repeating yourself over and over and over again on over and over and over 
and I, I've got a I've got a challenge now. I mean, I've got three kids all doing well. Do I give them money now, uh, or give them much more in a few years' time? And that's the big question, and I don't know how to solve it, quite frankly. Maybe some now, some later. Because I'd rather give kids money now than for them to wait till I die. Yeah, yeah. So I, so I can see them enjoy it, and I can help them get used to it. Yeah, very good. And you can help them uh, help them with some of the decisions around it. Yeah, and 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 some kids you give nothing. They're going to waste it. Give them nothing. If if they're in a rocky relationship, you give them nothing. You know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. So t- talk to me about the, um, you know, a lot of the conversations and we just sort of mentioned that there you can't take it with you. Talk to us about that, those sorts of conversations, you know, how how are you going to distribute it and what are you going to do with it and maybe, like as you mentioned, passing some out early. Well, as you get older, most of your pleasure has come from, from, from helping other people. I mean, I've, I've had the new cars and the new clothes, you know. Uh, that's a very passing pleasure. But if you can change a life with a gift, that's magic. So I think people should think about philanthropic activities as well. You know, I think that's important, and it's tax deductible. It doesn't help the pension. <laughs> I really like. I really like that concept. Pleasures come, you know, come from others, and and this probably do. brings us back to um, the community that you're in, and and how important the community that you're in, and your in your friends, and uh, the people that you're with uh, all all the time make a big difference in your life. You yeah, see, the, the, the world's happiest people aren't the wealthiest. The world's happiest people can be very poor, but, the, but they have a community and a support network. Now, I know that happiness solves a lot, um, money solves a lot of problems. I've got no doubt about that, right? <laughs> you know, but you need a balance, I think. There's so many things that, uh, that we could be putting into plans, right? Financial plans, and, and I, I guess retirement plans involve all of these things and uh, and then the, the financial side of it is, is quite a small side of it or it's the afterthought or it's the end of it, isn't it? It is. Uh, and I think estate planning is important. I mean, a lot of people don't know about the tax on superannuation if you die. You know, most people have never heard of the death tax and that can be very simply sold by withdrawing your money out of super tax-free just when you're about to die or having your attorney do it for you. That's easily sold. Most people have never heard of it. As long as as long as you know that it's coming, yeah. Oh yeah, sure. So, what are some of the biggest challenges uh, for people that are moving through the retirement space? Obviously, we talked about the, the numbers, but um, to me, I sort of feels like from a conversation that it's, a lot of it's a lot of it's mental, and a lot of it's um, yeah, obviously there's health, uh, but a lot of it's it's sort of the way that people are thinking of stuff. I think the biggest problem is the media. And the media give us bad news nonstop. You know, every year I read less papers and what. And watch less television because it's all the same. It's always a crash and a disaster, and someone's got sick, and there's a celebrity's got divorced, and you know it gives us a wrong view of the world. I mean, most people would be better off to lock themselves up for a year and leave their money be and come back. But I mean, obviously, if the market crashes, as it will always, you got to go and see how you went, and that's just human nature. I do it myself. I can't help myself. But yeah. it's not good. Yeah, the, the the media machine is a is a very interesting beast, and isn't it? You know, like the fear, uh, fear sells newspapers, fear sells uh, a lot of stuff, and so they, you know, they they create articles, they create fear, and it creates advertising dollars in the, yeah. in the pocket. And, Remember, COVID coming is going to be a good, going to be a recession, and the houses would drop twenty percent. Remember that last year, your house will drop twenty percent. There's going to be a recession. So it's almost like the people have decided to. Uh, Write their own history, not listen to the the uh, the sure. economists. And and people get half truths. I mean, I wrote an article recently. I, I'm totally opposed to using super as a house deposit. I think it will just drive up the price of housing. Plus, they lose twenty two percent in in exit tax if they withdraw it. If, if they're under sixty, well, I got attacked. Oh, you're being paid by the by the big fund managers, and it's nonsense. And why you're stopping young people getting a home? Yeah, it's, it's interesting this uh, again. And yes, the media is a big problem, of course. And and I guess you're part of the conversation when it comes to the, the media, not the media, but, you know, producing content for uh, for publications as well. That's sort of one of those things that it's, you know, it's, it's a hard line to, to walk, I guess. Well, you need to watch the line like it's okay for him. <laughs> you know, he doesn't know me, but yep. uh, you just keep putting it out, putting it out, putting it out. Yep. You know, people are still accepting phone calls from people. Yep. I say to people, if someone rings you, hang up. That's it. Yep. No argument. Yep. 
I, uh, I say that um, on the media side of it, uh, and, and I've had these conversations before around how much time the retirees are spending with the TV on in the, during the day. Yeah. And absorbing this content. Mind blowing. Do, would Mind you, blowing. do you know if I have any stats or what that might be? But it, I, I feel like it's, it's like, you know, most of the day. Well, they're probably bored, I guess. It's like people go and play the pokies all day. You know, <laughs> that's why you need a sense of purpose. You need things to do. You need a social network. That might be playing golf. It might be photography. It might be a travel group. Women do it better than men, basically, for some reason. Women are much more, I think women are much more social animals. Yeah, yeah. And this comes back down to, as you mentioned, joining a group or a club or a, or a, a group activity can be a way of really getting involved in, uh, yeah. in, in that, and finding that purpose if you don't really have it at the moment. Yeah. If you, if you can find an earning part-time job, then you don't draw so much on your super. If you don't draw so much on your super, it, it'll, it'll last longer. Now you mentioned sort of in the book some some parts there. Obviously, the stats show there's a very big difference between men and women when it comes to you know their retirement. That's starting with their retirement balance, I guess, um, yep. and how they go through. Uh, also, I've spoken um, to planners who you know who who say that there is a you know that's a very high demographic for homeless uh, single uh, females in in this space. Um, yeah. what, what have you seen? The the people worst off are a homeless person at retirement age and they tend to be women normally because of bad relationships i went to an all-day seminar on women and super put on by the for, by the female economists of Griffiths university and the major conclusion is women are less engaged than men in money now i think money non-stop my wife would rather go to book club you know <laughs> you know um women are women aren't that interested. well most women are less engaged and the main, from that whole day seminar, the one thing we all agreed upon was that women under 50, they should be in high growth in super as an opt out, not opt in. So you're in high growth unless you opt out. And that, that in itself would make a big difference. Yep. This sort of comes back down to individuals making decisions on their investment choices. And obviously with, we've been through a turbulent year last year and you know the amount of people you talk to that, that panicked and went yeah. to at the wrong time and, 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 and through fear and, and then all of a sudden they've missed the, the rebound. And so how do you feel about this, this concept of, um, you know, making, putting parameters in place where people kind of get that opt, opt out scenario where you should be here because of your demographic, we're going to put you here. And then if you really got a problem. Then well, I put- think, look, I think the average person just needs to be in a good super fund and let the fund worry about it. And then the fund may well have a mix that suits you. I mean, balanced. Balance is performing not much worse than high growth. I think high growth for 10 years has been nine point something and balance has been eight point something. Capital stable is about five. You don't want to be down there. Is that kind of because we have this weird perception of what high growth and balance mean? Should, should we have a standard definition? Well, they think it's risky, you know. <laughs> oh, no, I can't be in this risky stuff. I think that's the problem. Yeah. They don't, they don't understand risk. Yes. Every investment decision has good and bad points. You know, every decision you make has a good point and a bad point. Yeah. If you say, right, I'll stay in cash, then you won't suffer in a market crash. But no fraying dividends and no chance of growth. And your money won't last as long. So if we change the language from risk to, to pros and cons, then... Uh... I think so, Yeah. Yeah. It's an interesting one, isn't it? How, how do we? How can we change some of that language around? Well, we, we talk about those three heads I talked about. There's your own savings, which is your, your super, and the age pension and the lifetime pension. So, I don't, well, money in, in accumulation, money in the account-based pension is at call. So if you want 50 grand, you've got it, but the balance is volatile. The age pension should keep going as it does indexed. And your lifetime pension is there for life. So life, but you can't touch it. Having put your money in the lifetime pension, can't take it out again. Yep. So, so there's three pillars, and they're all different. Yep, fantastic. Uh, in the age pension, you're, you're dependent on government whims. In the lifetime pension, you can't take it out. And with an account-based pension, you can take it out, but, but, but you've got a volatile balance. How important is it to, to think about uh, when you're approaching retirement, not thinking about the, the total amount of money you have, 
but be thinking about that income per annum and what you what you know those sorts of things rather than the the total amount. Well, I think you've got to be prepared to spend capital. You can't put a million dollars in the bank and live off the interest. So you've got to be prepared to spend capital. And the 1.6 million transfer balance cap, as I understand it, was worked out on double the age pension cutoff for a couple then, and four times the single pension then was 88 grand a year. And $1.6 million will last for 25 years at inflation plus 4%, I think. And that's how they got it. So if you had $1.6 million in super, you should get 88 grand a year index for the next 25 years, be if you're 65 to 90. So that was the thinking behind it. Yep. But that assumes a total rundown of capital. Yep. And this is a mind. This is like spending capital. This is another mindset piece, right? Um, spending capital. I've saved this money. It's now savings. And now all of a sudden it becomes savings. Spending. I don't like it going down. And we may need it if we've got to go to a nursing home or one of the kids might have an emergency. So people have a savings mindset. Yep. So That's the point. Yeah. So what do you what do you say to your, your mate at the golf course who has a savings mindset and uh, and you're you're sort of convincing them that they need to change their mind? Well, I just say you can't take it with you. You know, and as I say to people, if you don't fly first class, your kids will. They go, ooh. <laughs> I was playing with a wealthy guy one day, well wealthy guy. And he's kept using old golf balls. I said, Lloydie, you'll die with thirty new golf balls in your golf bag. Start start using and using a new golf ball. Come on. Have a go and use it. <laughs> you might have just dubbed him in then. Oh, no, he's died a long time ago. <laughs> he's a nice old guy. Uh, never used the new golf balls. Yeah, it's fantastic. So I just want to go a little bit more into this this idea around um, uh, happiness in, in retirement. And you mentioned sort of that um, that it doesn't always, you know, it's, the, the demographic is not always financial obviously it is a bit financial but what, what have you found in your research around this happiness index and around you know zones and, and those sorts of things around where people and why people are the happiest well the best happiness is intrinsic not extra uh, extrinsic as i said the new car might be nice for a month and then it's a new car and it's an old car and away you go the real pleasure is family and friends and giving money away and contributing and having a sense of purpose and having a sense of purpose is very good for your health. And that's where true happiness comes from. You know, having things to do, helping somebody else. Uh, I mean, I enjoy what I do because I'm, I'm now like an ombudsman almost. I get so many problems and I help people solve their problems. And, and I love it. Yeah. Do you do that on an individual basis when people just approach you? Or If I, if I think it's a good story. Like I've got a couple at the moment. They were talked in. They went to a wealth creation night. They were convinced to open a self-managed fund. They live in Brisbane, put their $140,000 of super into this self-managed fund, then buy an apartment in Perth for 480 grand. It's now worth about 300. So they've dropped, they've lost their super and they've lost 180 grand. They just haven't wiped out their super. They've lost $180,000. It was a loan through a self-managed fund with personal guarantees. By n- How much I can do to help him? Yeah, by a non-functional plan, was it? Or? Well, no, he was a mortgage broker. He's, he's now got a life ban. They weren't helped by his best mate who was an insurance company broke. He sold them a necessary and expensive life insurance that, that, that they didn't need. That was eight grand a year. They've now got maxed against that company. Mm. So they're, they're the sort of things I get involved in. So you find these stories and... I guess yeah. try and help out as much as you can. Yeah. And I've got a couple at the moment. They got mixed up with the Bendigo Bank home safe deal in Victoria. 14 years ago, they sold Bendigo Bank a 55% share of their house for 102000 The house was worth under just under 400000 Now, the 55% is the most Bendigo get as time passes, but it's about 44% at the moment. The house is now worth $800,000. He's died. The widow's 86. There's now $328,000 owing to Bendigo Bank on this home safe product. There's a lot of products out there, aren't there, that uh, these reverse mortgages, and you mentioned that the word home safe doesn't sound very safe, but um, no. 
uh, you know, there's a lot of products out there that are being produced for in that space, for, like I said, reverse mortgages or other products, and and the and the concept yeah. of you know um, gearing your self managed super fund and all these types of things. No one does that. <laughs> how, how do we fix that? How do we make that such a the big part of the problem? Not uh, a lot. Uh, there's been a lot of fingers pointed at uh, at planners, and obviously there's there's been some people that have done the wrong thing and. Uh, and that's that's fair enough. But uh, where, where do we start making sure the products are safer? Well, there's doctors and lawyers have done the wrong thing too. I mean, this is mm. the whole point. Uh, and these aren't planners; they're property spruikers. Mm. In work in an unregulated space. Yep. But the real problem is equity release. Now, the retirement income review wants people to spend the equity in their house. So one, so a way is to sell it. Now, if you've got a million dollar house and you're on the full pension and you move to a half-million-dollar house, you've just released half a million dollars, which will affect your pension. So a plus spent about 100000 in moving costs. So that's got a cost, but maybe it's the only choice you've got. If you move to a retirement village or a land lease community, you cannot reverse mortgage your property. You can't do it. And then you've got the pension loan scheme at 4.5. The pension loan scheme is great because it's government-run, and they keep an eye on, on how you're doing, but it's paid fortnightly. So you've never got a big lump sum to start the compound. But it's no good if you want 20, 20 grand in a hurry. It's more for your expenses day to day because it comes every fortnight. Then you've got people like household capital, and, and that's, a, that's a reverse mortgage at 4.95% at the, the moment. But reverse mortgage means there's no payments of principal or interest. So at 5%, you're dead, dead or double in 14 years. Now, that's why they sh- it only should be taken out as a last resort. You know, so I think the family should be involved because what's happening is reverse mortgage means that you're spending money you would normally leave behind you. Maybe if you need 50 grand, the, the family could borrow 50 grand or at least pay the interest on your reverse mortgage. So, I mean, if you need 50 grand and you, and you get a reverse mortgage and the family pay the interest, there's no problem. Yeah. Okay. And uh, and and they so, can be toxic. And so one of the solutions, obviously, is this downsizing slash um, right sizing conversation, which I believe you've sort of uh, got a joint book on as well. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So talk to me about that. How um, is that sort of the preferred option before sort of a or even as part of a moving to a retirement or lend lease? Well, I think the big thing is a that you reach a stage you're in your eighties, the house costs a lot of maintenance, or not yet. Then you reach the stage, the maintenance gets so bad, you can't afford to spend the maintenance, so you're stuck in it. Then normally the bloke dies and the widow's there on her own and it's a lonely bit of life. Uh, Rachel and I both think they're better off to make a move to a retirement village or land lease community earlier where there's a social network there for them. You know, and people's lives are transformed. I can see. I can certainly see that. Um, I can certainly see that, uh, especially with the, the the big emphasis on the community within that um, within that space yeah. and uh, and the social side of it. Um, now we've talked a lot about um, the you know the negatives, I guess, uh, of this space. But talk, talk to us about some of the positives. What are some of the great things you see? Well, most people are better and happier than the media thinks. Most people cope quite well. In my book, I attack ageism, like mum can't cope. I'm too old for that. It makes me feel stupid. I won't do that. I'm old. They're just dangerous to your health. Most aged people cope pretty well. And people want to age at home, and most people do age at home. Yep. So you refer to it more aging, not old. Well, you're getting older. That's a fact of life. Remember, I'm 81, but I'm still going strong, so I love it. You know. Yep. Well, Kerry, I'm, I'm the same age as Kerry Stokes and John Howard and Jerry Harvey. And Warren Buffett's 90, yep. you know. So it's really great if you've got something you can keep on doing. Yeah, passion and purpose, love it. You don't want to be a lonely, grumpy old person. <laughs> why, why is that? Why do, we, we, why do people as they age, they get that reputation of being grumpy? Where does that come from? People are like that, I think. Yeah. But they were probably grumpy when they were young. You know, if you're grumpy, I think, I think you've always been grumpy. Uh, very good. Now, uh, talk to us about the book. You've finished writing it, released the, the new book called Retirement Made Simple. Um, I hear it's flying off the shelf. Yes. First print run 15, second five, third five. So 25,000 copies have been sold. This to me appears to be like a good book for planners who um, 
again, anything from 30 years out? Uh, just understanding. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, a lot of financial planners are now giving it to their clients as a gift. Wonderful. Uh, a lot of planners don't understand if you if if you give a gift, you start the power of reciprocation. If you give a client a gift, that's a great way of getting them. Yeah, fantastic. It's also a great service uh, throughout the year yeah, for an annual service agreement. As a planner, your job is to educate. The more educated your client, the happier your client. That's the yeah. whole point. Yeah, fantastic. So th- I'm th- happy th- when they get surprises and what they don't know. I've also I've also subscribed to the philosophy of when you're giving a gift, don't give a branded gift. Don't give a gift with your brand on it. I agree totally. Totally. I think, I think somebody once said to me, if you give me golf balls with your logo on them, I'll hit them in the and hit them in the lake, and I won't bother. But if you give me the same golf ball with no logo on it, I'll I'll uh, I'll take better care of it. Oh no no, I like a logo golf ball. It's a free one. I'm not, I'll cop it every day of the week if it's got a logo. <laughs> you're okay with the logo as long as it's a free golf ball. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Fantastic. Noel, thank you so much for coming and chatting to us today. Really appreciate uh, uh, gifting us your time and, uh, and going through that. If people want to com- uh, continue the conversation with you, what's the best way that they can get hold of you? Just go to the website. That's easy. noelwhittaker.com.au. Fantastic. And they can find the book there. If you Google me, you'll find me. I can tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, although so although I'm, I'm still waiting on your LinkedIn request, but I, I take it you don't spend a lot of time on oh, I don't spend much time on LinkedIn. I should. <laughs> One of those things I should get round to doing. Oh yeah, yeah. It's, At the it's, moment, I've got 180 emails in my inbox, and some of them are complex. And you know, it sounds like you're much you're um, you're much more engaged helping people uh, sort out their uh, financial situations and your real pur- enjoy, I love purpose. I love it. Purpose, yeah. I just love it. <laughs> Fantastic. Great. Wonderful. Thank you, Noel. Really appreciate Thank it. So uh, and we'll uh, we'll see you around the traps. Thank you. Well, there you have it, another episode of the XY Advisor Podcast. I'm Fraser Jack, and I'm joined by Emily Blanche. G'day, Emily. Hey, Fraser. <laughs> How are you going? <laughs> I am tremendous. How are Fantastic. you? I'm also tremendous. Isn't it a great day? Um, now, let's do some shout-outs. It's time for that uh, really cool part of the week where we get to shout-out to some uh, cool XY members. Let's do it. So today, a big shout-out to XY Advisor and legend, Alicia Laird. She got a shout out in the newsletter, actually, for being a top member. So she's one of our most active members at the moment. She is in the platform, adding value, answering questions. And she was recently on an XY podcast herself. She's an open book, as in she's always super willing to share and share her experiences and value and just, you know, really embodying what it means to be an XY member. So thank you, Alicia. Your generosity does not go unnoticed. We appreciate it. Thank you very much.